Hey guys, before we get started on today's episode, if you wouldn't mind supporting the channel just by liking and subscribing, if you're on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, just leave a review for us. And even if you're on YouTube, just comment down below what you want us to hear about or what you want us to talk about. It really helps us get even bigger guests and helps us grow even more. If you want to support us on a further level and you live in the greater Toronto Hamilton area and you want to work with us or just see if we're a good fit, click the first link down below in the description. You'll book a call from the comfort of your own home, get to know us a little bit better, our style, how we plan to sell or help you buy your first home or maybe second home, whatever it might be. We just go over your situation. It's completely free. All right. Without further ado, let's get into the episode. Canadian Real Estate Homefront Podcast. We have John Pasalis today on. I've been a big fan of his YouTube channel, Move Smartly, for a long time now. I sent him a cold DM because I think he saw one of my Instagram videos where I gave him a shout out. So he uh, he agreed to come on the podcast today. We're going to talk about all things Canadian real estate focus, but also some of the new measures that the liberals have have put out. But Without further ado, John, welcome to the show, and I'm really happy to have you. Thanks for having me. So we've seen a lot, a lot go on these days. Uh, the first topic I wanted to dive into was actually the video I spoke about. So you were saying on your YouTube channel, which uh, I stupidly never really thought about, was why are builders going to build when home prices are going down? And I just it really resonated with me. I'm like, <laughs> it's kind of like if Apple was to um, create an iPhone that was losing value, they might stop creating as many iPhones. So it kind of just hit me in, in simplicity terms. But yeah, I'd love for you to dive into that more because you're, you're really focused in the Toronto area and um, you know pre-sales have been down so much. So yeah, I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think this is, uh, I think one of the big debates I have with housing economists, you know, Yimby housing advocates. So that's the, you know, yes, in my backyard, a lot of like academic thinking these days, at least North American academic thinking is, you know, is the only reason home prices are high is because of zoning restrictions and politicians and red tape preventing, you know, builders to build. And if you just, you know, get the, the cities out of the way, builders will just build so many homes that home prices will fall and we'll all be able to afford one. And they'll want to keep building in an environment of declining prices. And, you know, this, of course, I mean, anyone with half a brain knows that this is delusional. I mean, builders are not in the business of driving down prices. I think this is the problem when you hear a lot of expert opinion that focuses exclusively on making homes affordable by, by pumping up more supply are kind of missing the point. No one in the construction industry wants prices to fall, right? So when you're when you're pretending that uh, if you just upzone everything, they'll build so many homes, price will crash. Uh, it's misguided. And to be clear, this does happen sometimes where you overbuild and prices crash. But that's because of an accident. You know, basically, it's not deliberate. What happens is it's kind of like what happened in like the U.S. financial crisis in Dubai. You know, like so many speculators buying properties they overbuild, you know, happened in Phoenix, happened in Vegas, they overbuild. And then when the market, fall, you know, bottom falls out of the market, you've oversupplied the market. And that kind of actually happened in the GTA in the early 90s, where we just overbuilt uh, and construction starts fell, prices were flat because we had a lot of supply. So these are not sort of something that builders are deliberately trying to do. I mean, in many cases, they just happen by accident. So, yeah, I do think it's a bit misguided when you hear experts tell you that, you know, builders want to drive down the cost of both house prices and rents because you see them on both, you know, uh, and I think that's a little bit silly. Do you think that we've built a lot of condos these days where now we're in this kind of category where we have seven months of inventory in Toronto. And, you know, I read a stat that Peterborough, Ontario built more three bedroom homes than all of Toronto. So is Toronto just building the wrong type of supply for the end consumer who wants a family and wants to be, uh, you know, in Toronto and in the city still? Is that is, a, is that just a pipe dream now that there's not enough land? What do you think about that? I mean, so it's a tough question because I mean, obviously, of course, we're not building enough low-rise homes. Like the only thing that can accommodate a family is a low-rise house. Condos are tiny. And if you look at Ontario, forget Toronto, Ontario has 23,000 low-rise homes under construction. 
for a province that goes by half a million people per year. So there's this obvious mismatch between, you know, the needs of growing families and a growing economy and the housing that we're building. Um, and that's not to say that a well-functioning housing market doesn't need small rentals. I mean, of course they do. So it's not like those are all worth this. Many of them are being rented. Um, but we have gone so far down this road where all we're building effectively are tiny rentals. Um, you know, we have between purpose-built rentals and condominiums, which are effectively largely rentals, we have like about 130,000 of those under construction compared to just 23,000 houses. So, yeah, I think we could be in this phase where you have very soft growth or negative growth in condos because we have a lot of it um, where low rise homes are kind of performing relatively well, just we don't have many of them. And people, most people, when they have a family, need a low rise house or so can't move into a 500 square foot condo. Right. Do you think that this kind of speculation bubble, because this is kind of what scares me the most about the real estate market in specifically the GTA, is that People took HELOCs against their home to speculate on this condominium that won't appraise, and many are coming up to uh, to you know their completion date, and the bank's going in and saying, "Well, you need another hundred k, you need another hundred and fifty k," or they're yeah. looking to rent it at this exorbitant price to cover their carrying costs because when they bought it, rates were at two, now they're at you know four and a half. Let's just say we can argue maybe four, but uh, anyways, is that kind of a really big risk to the condo market? Like, could the condo market take a crash, but the freehold kind of remains okay? Like, it feels like they're two different markets almost. Yeah, a hundred percent, it's a risk. And you know, I've been flagging this for some time, not because I was I was predicting we would get to this point, but this was always a risk when you have pre con selling at thirty to forty percent above resale, right? There's the risk that if resale prices do not rapidly increase, your newly completed condos are not going to be worth what people paid for them. That has always been a risk. For years, we had the government pumping up prices, but things have been flat for four years. And the reality is, when you have a, a new housing market driven by what is effectively speculation, I mean, listen, many people will there's a you know will debate what's a speculator, what's an investor. At the end of the day, you're buying precon because you're speculating on the increase in the value, right? That's it. You're not you're not doing it for any other reasons. In many cases, many of those investors didn't even have twenty percent down. That's why they bought precon because they have two years to save up the balance of their deposit, right? Right. So it is a largely a speculative investment. And many agents frame them as speculate speculative. Like the many agents were framed like you don't even have to close. You know, a year before completion, we'll just assign it. You'll make 100, 150, 200 grand. It's the easiest money you'll ever make. This was like the pitch from a lot of agents. And when you have a new housing market driven by speculation, like I said, it's not that different from what we saw in Dubai and in Phoenix and in Vegas during the financial crisis. These were all like speculative bubbles, right? Mm -hmm. um, and those, those side effects are playing out today because for other economic reasons, prices aren't going up 10% a year. You know, those investments only make sense when prices are going up 10% per year. Well, all of a sudden, you're not an investor if you can't freaking close on it and you're only banking on 10% annual <laughs> uh, appreciation. You're speculating and your speculative bet is not paying off. So, you're, you know, some of those are defaulting, unfortunately. Right. Uh, that's a good point. So we're going to get into all the um, everything that liberal government's doing that I think is is kind of this like, let's, you know, they're, they're framing, they're gaslighting younger Canadians saying, you know, we're going to help you. You know, we're going to make a housing affordable. But I want to ask this one question for you. If you weren't able to pile on more debt to the younger generation, is the only way for housing to become affordable is that prices fall? That's a good question. I mean, listen, there's there's effectively one or of two ways where prices can become affordable. A, prices fall is the most obvious one. Mm -hmm. No government wants to do that because... For obvious reasons, two thirds of the of, of the voting base are homeowners, and you know I'd say many don't want to see prices plummet, right? And that's not a sustainable long term plan. Or, you know, the other approach is that just home prices don't really appreciate, uh, and wages eventually outpace 
um, house price appreciation. That latter approach is, of course, a lot longer. It's harder. You're sitting around for 10 years for your salary to outpace house price appreciation. Um, but yeah, there's no other avenue. I mean, you're either like lower prices or lower prices relative to incomes. And that's it. I mean, uh, more mortgage debt doesn't make homes more affordable. Um, it just allows you to borrow more. Yeah. And I think that's what they frame it as, right? Like, okay. So the, the new thing that they did was CMHC had a, had a cap up to a million bucks on mortgages. Now it's 1.5 million. So basically you can put down less than 20% and you can buy a house up to 1.5 million. And I, and I heard you speaking about this and I actually liked your framework behind it because you said that this should be a provincial thing, right? Someone in, in, you know, Saskatchewan probably doesn't need the, um, the increase from 1 million to 1.5 million. They probably don't need that, but you know, maybe in Toronto, you might need that in BC, you might need that, but is the underlying problem that housing is just way too unaffordable for young people. So like piling on more cheap debt, we're almost just kicking the can down the road that one day it's got to hit the wall. The can can't get kicked down the road anymore where prices have to come down. Or do we just keep extending the debt for people to um, keep paying these homes and kind of passing on this idea that housing is the best investment you can make. So there's, I mean, I think there's two possible theses for this, right? Uh, and it depends on your worldview and how you see Canada's economy. So certainly there are a segment of people who believe this isn't sustainable, right? Mm -hmm. This is a debt bubble, like all debt bubbles, this is going to crash. Look at what happened in the U.S., our household debt to GDP, household debt to disposable income is among the highest in the G7, among the highest in OECD. This is all going to come crashing down. It's not sustainable, right? So that certainly is one thesis. I think this is, has, has been driving most people who are very pessimistic about the housing market this is kind of one of their main theses. Like this is just all going to collapse because it's a, a bubble built on debt that's just going to fall apart. Um, and I don't think that is the case. I actually think what's happening in Canada are it's, it's not like household debt isn't so high relative to incomes, relative to uh, house prices because of crappy loans, because of uh, you know, ninja loans, what they had in the US, like no income, no jobs, it doesn't matter, you'll still get a, you know, a half million dollar mortgage. It's not that it is structural, right? Like since the 90s, the role that housing plays in Canada's economy, uh, and the wealth from housing has changed fundamentally, right? Uh, in the past 20 plus years, economists, not economists in our government have actually been leaning on household debt to actually drive our economy, right? So the more your home appreciates, well, the more you want to go out and spend, you want to renovate your house, you want to go on, buy more expensive things, and you just like, add that to your debt. Ask how many mortgage brokers end up renewing mortgages and adding credit card debt and unsecured line of credit debt to their mortgage. So the household's mortgage debt actually increases rather than decreases over time, right? And on top of that, as you said, it is debt, household debt and HELOC debt is the source of equity and capital to buy pre-construction condos. So if you just think about it, a lot of our new housing construction is actually underpinned by existing homes, by debt on existing homes. It's fueling new housing construction because our government couldn't think of a smarter way to build new homes other than have mom and pop investors use HELOCs to you know, put down on $1,800 square foot pre-construction condos, right? So our government almost re like relies on household debt to fuel our economy. And as we've seen during COVID and we've seen recently, they'll do everything they can to prevent home prices from falling, right? Even in periods like COVID, high unemployment, no worries, just stop making your mortgage payments, we'll sort it out. Interest rates surge, Instead of people increasing their payments, we'll have negative amortization, which means their payment doesn't even cover the interest. They don't care. So anything to keep home prices from falling. Um, and now, of course, they're doing everything to stimulate home price appreciation, right? So 
I don't think, again, I, I'm just, and it's not to say that home prices are going to go up 10% per year, but I don't necessarily think that this is this debt bubble that's going to collapse. A lot of the debt, of course, is backed by house values. And house values, of course, are higher than sort of the debt that our people are holding. And in particular, with low-rise homes, um, that's going to hold. Now, what happens with condominiums? Can we see prices fall there? 100%. I mean, I'm not making a thesis that everything's going to keep going up forever. There are certainly risks. Um, and they might play out very seriously for some of the new condominiums that are completing, for some of the resale market. It's very tough to predict, especially if our current government and our, our next government, likely the conservatives, scale back our population growth to a more modest level. Yeah, you could all of a sudden see all of us. I mean, rents are falling and many you know, Ontario towns, rents are falling. All of us, we had a supply crisis a year ago. All of a sudden, rents are falling because we're not supercharging the demand for housing. So it, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. But yeah, there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of kind of risks ahead still. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, the, the, the idea behind population growth. So we always talk about supply all the time. And I always heard Rich talk about this on um, Steve's podcast of Looney Hour. Yeah. And he said, we're so focused on supply, but what if you killed the demand side of the equation? And like you just said, if the conservatives pull back on population growth to more sustainable levels, will that ultimately decrease rents, ultimately forcing more people to sell, mm -hmm. maybe decreasing the actual resale prices? Well, I mean... Potentially. I mean, I, and I think we're starting to see that play out already, right? right? Like like I said, this is the first year where the feds have decided to scale back non-permanent resident growth. And a lot of that was students. And we're seeing rents start to cool in a lot of in a lot of those communities. Um, so if that continues, are we gonna I think if that continues, we're, there's gonna be two kind of side effects to that. Anyone who bought a low-rise home in small towns where or colleges are gonna have a hard time making their numbers work. As many of those people are renting them out as rooming houses to international students, uh, that's gonna be harder to work. So you might see some of those people start selling their units um, and we just might have no rent growth or even negative rent growth as we're seeing. Um, and listen, I think negative rent growth is a positive thing, quite frankly. I mean, I'm an investor. I have rental properties. Like I'm, you know, I don't want my rents to go down, but at the end of the day, man, renter, renters are the ones that are really getting crushed the most from all of this. Like not only can they not afford a freaking home now, our government's jacking, was jacking up the rents 10, 15% per year uh, by supercharging the demand. So can they, can they, are they better off with a little bit of a decrease, you know, all the power to them. Right. I think you said something uh, pretty evident at the beginning. You said two thirds of voters are um, homeowners, and I think that when you when you see all these policies going into play, right, <laughs> we're going to help the next generation. We're you know we're going to increase this. We're going to give you down payment money, whatever they're proposing, right? Mm -hmm. It they're not. I think the big thing is they're not doing it for the younger generation. I think they're doing it for the voters right now to keep their house prices elevated and also even the banks, right? Like the banks is an oligopoly and they, they're in the business of collecting interest. If less people are buying homes, if people are defaulting on their homes and they're selling at a loss, this doesn't look good. So I feel like the government needs this ability to prop up the housing market because every time the housing market cools, like we saw in the summer, Toronto market was dead, right? Mm -hmm. There wasn't a lot going on. Yeah. They come out and they they just they throw fuel on the fire. Like, here's another policy. Here's we're gonna make it easier for you to buy. And I know people who are waiting for December 15th when they introduce the 30 year AM on 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 the less than 20 percent down on the uh, sorry for first time home buyers where uh, if you have less than five percent down even on seven hundred thousand, like it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Oh, so I guess 100%. my overall my overall question is, um, I think they frame it in a in a good way, right? Like the media gives a headline like. We're going to make housing more affordable, but the underlying issue is that it's not more affordable. It's just adding more debt. It is. And listen, I think it is adding more. That's what their solutions are. And I'll say one thing, um, you know, just to clarify, I do think that there is this misguided belief that every single person who owns a home wants the value to go up 10% per year, right? 
I think there's this misguided belief that we every homeowner would revolt if prices fell 10%. I think it was uh, um, Adam Vaughn, who was like the former parliamentary secretary for housing for the liberals. He was like on a TVO commercial or a TVO interview. You know, and he actually said, you know, raise your hand if you want the value of your home to fall 10%. You know, obviously no homeowner wants this. You know, and he sounded, I mean, a, a bit silly, I think. Because the reality is, the vast majority of people who own the homes do not track its value like a stock, okay? Like the average person has no idea what their home, especially people who have lived there for 10 plus years. Like younger people maybe do that are trying to get in or just bought their home are obsessed with it. Anyone who's lived in their homes for a long time probably doesn't know what their home's worth and would be shocked if you told them what it's worth today. But on top of that, these rapidly increasing home prices are actually, it's, it's not this windfall necessarily we see it uh, as we see it for boomers because the boomers are usually faced with one of two negative outcomes from that. Number one is if they have kids, their kids are leaving the city or leaving the province for somewhere more affordable. So now they don't have their kids near them. They don't have their grandkids near them. And if they don't move, they feel like they have to borrow $100,000 against their home to help their kid buy a house, right? So there are negative side effects, even for those kind of people in those situations. So I don't think every single person, just because they want a home, wants to see home prices skyrocket. I think that's misguided. I think even many people who are boomers who have kids are equally concerned at how high home prices are. Um, and I think our, our government's just not reading the room very well. Yeah, that, that's a good point. I think that housing <laughs> should be like a good store of value, like an inflation hedge. You're, you're paying it down. You're, you Maybe you're doing improvements over time. But what happened during COVID was when rates dropped so quickly, it was kind of like this, at first it was this kind of stall, right? Like rates hit, rates drop, they rock bottom. People were still cautious going out there, even though rates were really low. And then as they got more comfortable with the virus, they started going out and buying and buying and buying. And we saw prices rise 52% in what, two, two three years? <laughs> it was, yeah, it was crazy on, on leveraged money. So yeah. was that a mistake? Should we have just let, I know it's, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, but should we have just let the market fail in a sense like should we just let prices go down in that in that moment or should we have stimulated a bit but not as much what's your kind of take on how did we get from not a crazy market in 2018 which wasn't that long ago to this yeah. to this insane market in 2022 and we've even had quite a dip in a lot of areas you know hamilton burlington some places are down 20 percent. some of these covid darlings even out in woodstock are down even more so yeah i'd love mm -hmm. i know i asked you a few questions there but i'd love to get, get your opinion on it I mean, I think it's hard to say. I mean, again, hindsight's twenty twenty. If we remember at the, at the start of COVID, there was a lot of uncertainty, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the Bank of Canada didn't put rates to zero to stimulate housing necessarily. Like they did it for so many other, I mean, every other central bank around the world was doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and they did it to stimulate the economy. At the end of the day, there was still a ton of risks. Um, you know, supply chains were constrained, so they had to do something. I mean, did they anticipate that the housing market would boom? No. I mean, most people didn't. I mean, most people didn't expect the housing market to rally the way it did. But when you put rates to zero, I mean, everyone wanted to become a real estate investor. I mean, or it's a not when you get a five year mortgage at one and a half percent or whatever the heck they were going for at the time. Um, you know, it obviously fueled a ton of demand. Um, and, and really, again, the other thing was it wasn't just investors. It just once the market started to rally, it pulled a lot of buying demand forward. Right. So a lot of people who were thinking, I'm not going to buy for another year and a half or two years. All of a sudden, they're like rates hit the floor. You know, the market slowed down. Now's the time to buy. Everyone kind of made this decision at the exact same time. So it's hard. you can't predict this. It's effectively like this herd behavior, right? Um, and you can't predict it. And the challenge is once they did it, once rates hit zero, you can't really reverse it, right? Um, so, you know, we were kind of stuck with that. And yeah, the market rallied and prices skyrocketed in two years. And that was yeah. international. It wasn't just Canada, quite frankly. It wasn't... 
a Canadian phenomenon that happened in the US that happened in European countries. Like it's, it was sort of an international trend. It's almost like you devalued the currency where, where you printed so much money. It's another rabbit hole we can go down, but you printed so much money where you're buying power, obviously with inflation and, uh, you know, however they want to measure it. Um, I guess in a way it, 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 you know, the money's not worth as, as much as it once was because there's more money circulating, but I guess that's a conversation for, for another time. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to touch on that. So what's your idea going forward now that you, you know, we've talked about how much we gain, we gain that 52%. I've heard Benjamin Tal talk about this is that we borrowed so much from the future. So we mm-hmm. probably won't see that seven, you know, you know, the beautiful thing everyone always said, you get 7% per year in real estate. You know, that was kind of the, and it was true. You did. You looked at the, the long-term chart. Yeah. Does this market today look to you like the nineties where it's just going to trade sideways? It's so hard to say. I, I, it's hard and it's hard to predict. I mean, I don't have yeah. a prediction. My, my instinct is the low rise market might see like modest growth. And and again, like largely because we're not, we're not building houses. Like this is the segment that is very constrained. Um, will the condo market grind sideways? Possibly. I mean, I think that the challenge with condos is not just everything that's going on in the market is I think we're also seeing, I mean, I'm seeing kind of on the ground, just less of an appetite to be a condo investor, right? Between the negative cash flow, between flat growth and between with all the challenges with a landlord tenant board, there's just like fewer people who want to deal with that. It just seems like a bit of a headache now. Like it obviously everyone wants to do it when prices are going up 10% on a leverage asset. Every, you don't have to be a genius to say, okay, that's actually a very good return. You know, I've, I've kind of doubled my money in a couple of years. Um, you know, so you don't need a PhD to sort that one out. But today, you know, in an environment where condo prices might be flat and sluggish and rents are softening and LTB issues. Yeah, you get fewer people wanting to be, um, you know, investors. So I think I think there are still challenges, and it's hard. It's honestly so hard to predict because it's not just, you know, a lot of this really depends on what our governments do, right? Both in terms of policy to stimulate demand, but also policies to cool demand. You know, uh, all of the things that they're doing with population growth, it could have a material effect. If we're at a period a year from now where our population is only growing by 300,000 people per year rather than 1.3 million people per year, that's going to have a very significant side effect on the market. Uh, And it's hard to predict where things go as a result of that. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So speaking of government policies um, and investors, it kind of goes into my next thing. So I was reading what you were putting on Twitter, this new $2 million cap if you refinance and make a second dwelling at your home. So if you put a basement suite in or you want to, I think it's, you can build up to four units. Yeah. Um, you were saying on Twitter, which always worries me about every house I do. I always like look at the comp so deeply because I never want my buyers to go buy a house and the appraisal comes in short. That's a huge mm-hmm. thing that I always think about. I never yeah. want to be, yeah. And, and I always want to tell them about it because people don't know that the banks go in and appraise your home, right? They think, well, I'm approved for 1.2 million. I can, I can buy 1.2 million, but the bank, you might see a house and value it at 1.2 billion, but the bank might value it at 115. Your appraisal came in short. You're already leveraged. You already put every dollar you save for the last 10 years, if you're a millennial into this house, and now you got to come up with another 50 grand. So what do you think about this new policy? If you're refinancing your home, you're putting in a second unit and the, the cost outweighs the appreciation on the home. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, so we have to separate a couple things. I mean, someone putting in a base to an apartment for 80 grand or 100 grand. I mean, the cost is not necessarily going to oh, I mean, it might outweigh the appreciation marginally, but not significantly, right? The risk is more for people who are building are, are converting their home to a multiplex number 1 or building like laneway suites or things like that. Um, and for sure, there's a higher risk that once you take in the cost of the house and the cost of the construction, um, the value does not equal the sum of both of those things. It's going to equal to something less than that, generally speaking. Uh, and I think this is the challenge with their policies. Again, I think it's um, 
you know, and it's hard to say, I don't know if they're going to be, you know, and I put online that they're going to be financing the construction. I don't know if they are. It's not a hundred percent. It seems like they're allowing people to refinance to help finance construction. But even if they don't, they're putting it in people's heads that, you know, if you have a $1.4 million home and, and you spend 600 to build a multi-unit home and it's worth 2 million, we'll lend you up to 90% of that. But it's very possible that when they actually get their appraisal at the end, it's not worth 2 million. Like I said, and, and they're going to have these, these amateur builders slash investors, or they're trying to frame it as homeowners building multi-generational homes. They kind of don't know what they're getting into. And I think it's like a massive risk. And I see all sorts of people like on investor forums now, like talking about how, you know, they bought a four, they bought a, D, a bungalow and I built a fourplex and I added a million dollars in value and I'll show you how to do it. And I'm like, look, I'm like, are you people like everyone signing up? Like, show me how and I'm like, this just sounds insane. Like you cannot get a, a fourplex or a fiveplex that plays that four and a half million dollars. Like, give me a freaking break. It's like, Anyhow, so there are all sorts of all sorts of risks with this. Um, and you really shouldn't have like 90% loan to value government insured mortgages on $2 million properties. I don't care if you add uh, a laneway house to it. I think it's just very risky. But anyhow, that's just kind of my thoughts on what the government's doing. But again, it's just all about pumping up more debts to uh, to keep things moving. Who insures these mortgages? Where does this money come from? When CMHC mm. insures it, where does it come from? Okay, so I mean, the insurance and where the money comes from are kind of two different things, right? Uh, so the insurance, so basically banks have their own capital or they go out and borrow money, right? They have what we have like called Canada mortgage bonds where basically people can bundle, banks can bundle insured mortgage debt to get it off of their books. Um, and the the bank will buy some of those bonds, right? Or a, a Bank of Canada is buying some of those bonds. So it depends on what it is. Again, if it's insured mortgages, the CMHC doesn't fund it. They just insure it, right? But they have a mechanism that allows financial institutions to take that more insured mortgage debt off of their kind of books effectively, kind of sell it um, to free up capital. And really... You know, because it's government insured, those are like the most rock bottom interest rates you're going to get because they're basically 100 percent guaranteed by the government. So uh, and quite frankly, they're among the riskiest, you know, having 90 percent loan to value on a two million dollar investment property is pretty risky. But we're giving that the cheapest, cheapest debt. Mind you, they're paying a massive premium. It's probably going to be like a seventy thousand dollar CMHC mortgage insurance premium. But that's a whole other kind of issue. Which doesn't go to principal. It doesn't increase the value of your property. It's just a premium that you pay and you'll never see back, right? Well, yeah. And if it actually gets added to the mortgage. So if you think about it, you actually end up with these uh, people who have actually only 5% equity in their home. Because if they originally had 10, but you know, four to five of that's going to mortgage insurance, mortgage insurance. you have almost zero equity. So very wow. crazy speculative. <laughs> Very speculative. Um, okay, so let's let's touch on rates here. So I've yeah. been showing a ton of houses lately, and you know I think there's a lot of overpriced listings in Toronto. I I, I tell I tell agents that I'm like e even my buyers can go on House Sigma and see the one that sold down the road, go through the pictures, look at the the ups and downs, and they go why why, is it, why are they listed at one two five and this one's at one point one. So mm -hmm. I go to the, I always go to the agent and I say, Hey, look, you know, I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just, you know, I'm looking at the facts. I'm looking at, at what's around. You've been on for, you know, three, four months here. This is what the neighbor's selling for. My guys are interested at that price. What do you think? Well, no, Cortez rates are coming down. The bank of Canada is going to drop rates more. So when rates come down, prices are going up. I'm seeing things heating up. I'm getting more showings. There's, there's been more sales. So the bond yield is going up. What, you know what we just saw it's 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 just matched what happened in July and the bond market is forward looking yep. a lot of these agents don't understand that the overnight rate is not connected to the fixed rate that's what they they're not putting two and two together my long winded question is are we so uneducated that we're almost creating the speculation in the market by saying oh rates are coming down without like i always have to tell my buyers i'm like they're like oh well next rate i can probably get a cheaper rate I'm like, well, are you going fixed or variable? And they go, well, I'm going fixed. Anyway, so a lot of agents are just saying, hey, the market's going to go up because rates are going to come down. Are you under that same impression? Or do you think that 
rates are going to come down astronomically like they have, or are we kind of bottoming out here for the next little while? Well, I mean, listen, it's tough to say. I don't think it is crazy to think that the market in the new year will be busier if every fixed rate is in the threes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, like, and again, I don't think that means prices are going to skyrocket, but I think they will be like the market will be busier than it is today. That combined with mortgage insurance changes that we talk, you know, like the cap on all of that is stimulative, right? So it's reasonable to think the market's going to be busier. I think where a lot of these agents are making a mistake. And again, this is like the expectations of sellers. They think come January, my home's going to be worth 10% more than it is today. <laughs> yeah. So I just need to wait, right? And yeah. that's not what I'm suggesting. I mean, I certainly don't think that. I, I think it's very possible if rates actually move in that direction, that homes will sell a bit faster. They're not going to be sitting in the market for months. Um, but you're right. I think, you know, but these are hard to predict. As you clearly pointed out, bond yields are going in the opposite direction. Fixed rates are actually trending up, you know, or will yeah. be trending up. And the average seller doesn't get that because they're just thinking Bank of Canada rates, what's happening with the Bank of Canada. And obviously there's a relationship there. Um, but the bond market's its own thing, and it's not entirely driven. I mean, it's dri driven by what's going on in the bond market and, and in part what's going on in the U.S. bond market. So, um, again, yeah, I think there's just a lot of uncertainty with where rates go. But I do think the market probably will be busier if rates drop. But again, I think this this is just that the stubborn seller who's looking at 2022 prices and has just been waiting for that. You know, they're waiting for the market to rally so they can get what their, their neighbor sold for two years ago. Yeah. And I don't know if that's happening anytime soon. I, I can't agree with you more. It's like people get this obsession that, they, you know, they say, oh, I lost $100,000. It was like, no, like you were uh -huh. never, for, you, you know, you were never for sale. Like you can't lose yeah. something when you, it's like if you own Tesla stock and it was at a thousand bucks and now it's, it's not, but it was at a thousand bucks. Now it's at 800. Oh, I lost. No, you never had it. Cause you didn't press sell or you didn't have 100%. the for sale sign in, in your, in your, in your ground. So yeah, a lot of the stuff I'm looking at is like exactly what you said. And, and you're seeing more for sale prices. You're seeing price reductions. You're seeing yeah. agents get really challenged in this market when before it was so easy, right? I got yeah. into the market in 2016. So you know, the craziness of 2017, right? Like that's when I yeah. first was in it. It's like, man, it's so easy to sell a house. You just put, you just put a for, for sale sign in, you make 20 grand. This is amazing. Yeah. Then all of a sudden the, it's like, as soon as they added that tax, it was like all the foreign buyers in Oakville were gone. They yeah. were just, the tap got turned off. Prices were dropping and dropping and dropping. And then you went back to the, you know, the old norm and people had to get used to that idea that those yeah. prices weren't coming back. Obviously, once COVID hit, they did come back uh, and, and even then some. So it's tough to say. It honestly is. It's tough to say where this market's going. And then people ask me all the time, what do you think is going to happen? I just say, look, if you like the house and you can afford the house, you should buy the house. If you can't, yeah. don't buy the house. You know, go 100%. rent, stay with your parents um, or do do whatever. But I wanted to ask you just to kind of finish up here. What would you like to see from the government going forward to create housing to be more in reach for the younger generation? So, you know, your kids don't have to move away as an example or, uh, or ever your family doesn't have to move to Edmonton to afford a home. You know, what, what do you want to see? I, I mean, I think we're, again, there's, there's a lot of things. Once your housing market gets so unaffordable, it's very, very hard to rewind the clock, right? Mm -hmm. Because rewinding the clock means prices plummeting 40% or 30%, which is unlikely to happen. No government's going to want to do that. So it's very hard to go backwards. Um, you know, moving forward, well, I think we've already seen change in 2024. I mean, most of the political parties, I mean, the conservatives and the liberals, Quite frankly, they stopped listening to all of these supply side housing activists who kept arguing that, you know, housing completions can triple overnight, that our population growing by 1.3 million people per year is sustainable. It's just a supply problem. Uh, this was obviously all, uh, quite frankly, nonsense and kind of is what got us to this point. 
Uh, cause we're, as we're, you know, we talked about earlier, the second you kind of take the foot off the gas, all of a sudden rents are falling, uh, in these small towns. So certainly I think matching up population growth with housing completions, which we're finally starting to see the liberals do and talk about it. And even the conservatives very recently, uh, and you know, on top of that, you need to see more reforms on the supply side, a hundred percent. We need more high density housing. You know, the concern that I have, though, is that a lot of the advocacy for density and for more supply is really just driven by people who couldn't care less, who's building, who's buying, they're buying micro units or building micro units, whatever makes the most money. They're, they, they're kind of advocates of really financializing housing. Uh, and that's not really a way to make it affordable for tomorrow's young families, because building a, even a family sized missing middle home is not as lucrative from an investment perspective as a 500 square foot missing middle rental, right? So, you know, you almost need policies that um, kind of mitigate sort of the negative side effects of having mom and pop investors or, or REITs or whatever buying up all of our housing stock and having us only build what has the highest yield, uh, for investors, right? And we need to have an environment where we're building housing that can accommodate families. And that doesn't necessarily mean detached home in the suburbs or the big backyard. Maybe it is, you know, missing middle, kind of more urban homes, multi-unit housing. But I think you have to have policies that ensure that that's what we're building rather than just leaving it to the market to build whatever it wants. And and because that's kind of how it caught, how we got to this broken condo market where all we're building are, uh, as mortgage broker Ron Butler calls them, dog crate condos. So uh, hopefully we move away from that. Yeah, no, I like that. That's good. I, I think that the idea that like owning a townhouse or a row home is, is so out of reach for so many people. Um, and it's just such a simple three bedroom, two bath home with a small backyard. You can't even kick a soccer ball across it. And that's become so unattainable for millennials and, and the next generation. So, yeah, it's yeah, it's crazy. It's it's the, the amount of income you need, even like you said, a townhome, a million bucks, like is a lot of townhomes in the suburbs or 900,000. You still need like even if you have a hundred thousand dollar down payment, I mean, to get you need like an eight hundred thousand dollar mortgage. Right. Which basically means you have to have a household income over one hundred fifty, close to two hundred thousand dollars to afford that. Like, which yeah, is nuts. Right. Yeah. And then so, again, too, yeah. like if you're servicing all this debt in your home, you're not out spending in the economy and then other areas of the economy get hit, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're not going out for that dinner. You're not going buying clothes. You're just servicing servicing the debt uh, uh, on your home. Anyways, John, I really appreciate this. Uh, hopefully I'll have you back on when we see what happens next year. But any closing thoughts, anything you want to leave leave us with? Uh, no, I mean, thanks for having me. I mean, I think it is, uh, I mean, obviously this type of content's good. I think it's good that people are getting different ideas from different people and, and we'll see how the housing market evolves over the next year or so based on kind of the changes our governments were doing. It'll be interesting to track. Yeah. I think it'll be fun to see the election come up. It'll, it'll be fun to see the different platforms. I feel like, um, the conservatives and, you know, every, every, platform is kind of holding back on what they intend to do because they don't want the other person to steal the idea. So I think it'll be fun to see to see those debates and, and see what they have in store for, for housing. Because I know a lot of voters that are going to be out there this year or next year, whenever we have this election come up, and they're going to be voting based on, you know, cost of living and housing. So I think it'll be uh, it'll be interesting to see. But yeah, I'll I'll link John's YouTube channel down below, Move Smartly. He's got some really good stuff, some really good ideas. It's great if you're even just younger and you want to get a pulse in the market and just understand things a little bit more rather than, than reading the media headlines. He dives into a lot of economic stuff that I even find valuable as a real estate agent. So I appreciate that, John. And uh, if you want to work with John, I will leave his email as well down there. He's a real philosophy and uh, I'll leave his website there for you guys too. So thanks so much for coming on, man. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.